name's John Durant. I'm the director of the MIT Museum and also the executive director of the Cambridge Science Festival. You're all in for a real treat, as you probably realize. Uh, this is a unique event, to my knowledge. Uh, I've not come across anything quite like this before. Um, it really does combine great science, science that we have every reason to be interested in, with, I think, some great uh, tastes. A key institution to which I want to really uh, give a shout out is Mass General Hospital. Uh, the hospital has been the lead in suggesting this event, in suggesting key uh, nutritionists uh, and physicians who uh, could contribute to it. I want to say a particular word of thanks to Dennis Orciello, who's standing over on my right, to Ramnik Xavier, and to Wayne Schreffler, who've really uh, put themselves out uh, to make this event possible. But I do need to give a special vote of thanks to the person and the organization that I mentioned last, and that's uh, to let's talk about food, because that's basically what we're here to do. And I want to introduce the founder of Let's Talk About Food, Louisa Kasdan, who is going to introduce our main speakers this evening. Louisa. My name is Louisa Kasdan, and I started um, a series of programs with the Museum of Science where people would come together, the public and experts, and learn about food. And I called it by the incredibly elegant and cool name, Let's Talk About Food. Since then, we've done about 50 events all over the city with partners, that, a list of partners of nonprofits and institutions and for-profits that continues to grow. My um, presenting partner is now the Boston Globe and bostonglobe.com and boston.com, and that is quite exciting for me. This particular event is also the result of another true confession. I used to be in the restaurant business, and when people would come into my restaurants, with this whole list of allergies, I would think, not charitably, why don't they just stay home? <laughs> and God listened, um, and a few years in the middle of this, um, he decided to give me a little bit of a taste, and I got celiac. And I thought, ha, huh, now I get it, and I should be careful what I wish for. That has led me into many interesting conversations, and one of the most interesting happened last summer, quite by accident, with Dr. Dennis Oziello. Um, on a whole other task, because I am a journalist, I was down interviewing um, Dr. Oziello at his house on the Cape, and we're talking about a whole range of medical issues for the article I was doing, and I asked him about what he thought about food allergies. And his, um, his perspective on it, his take on it, his construct of thinking about the digestive tract as a kind of cave to life was just so fascinating to me that I conceived of an idea to bring together the public and a range of experts to figure out what science does and doesn't know, what we need to understand about why food allergies are on the rise, not just in America, not just in Boston, but all over the globe. Dr. Oziello has one of the few resumes I was saying that is just incredibly intimidating to read, and that coupled with a very unintimidating, approachable personality just kind of blew my socks off. He is, among other things, the Emeritus Director of the MD-PhD program at Harvard Medical School. He was the Emeritus Chairman of Medicine at um, MGH. He is the Director of the Center for Assessment, Technology, and Continuous Health. The acronym is CATCH. He is a Harvard man all the way, and I happen to know that he was a, he was a significant baseball player at Harvard. He is a local Boston product, and I think you'll find every single thing he has to say truly fascinating, as I did. So without going on any longer, let me introduce Dr. Oziello. Well, thank you, Louisa. So the GI tract, as we abbreviate it, um, is, of course, a source of nutrition. Um, it is also a powerful part of the immune system, uh, both positively and negatively, as you will hear. Um, it has in, within itself another organ, only recently understood to the extent uh, of its contributions to wellness and disease, and that is the microbiome, the number of bacteria that reside in our cell, uh, in our GI tract, have more cells than all of our human cells. 
Some might argue that we evolved as an ideal incubator for bacteria, but they play an important role in many of the topics that you'll hear described today. And of course, within all of this, we have nutrition, we have immunity, and we have a sewer. And for all of those things, the GI tract has to be exquisitely matched in how it does its job well, and sometimes how it does its job perhaps a little too well, and accentuating for the immune system, accentuating the symbiosis between some of these bacteria that grow within our gut, and ultimately that can lead to mild to moderate to even very severe disease. So we're gonna focus on understanding the GI tract, understanding the contributions that these multifaceted components of it ultimately contribute to our well-being and to our illnesses. And it's a pleasure tonight uh, to have the two elegant and eloquent speakers from the Mass General Hospital. Um, the first that I will introduce is Dr. Romnick Xavier, who I had the privilege of naming as the chief of the gastrointestinal unit a couple of years uh, back uh, while I was still chairman. And he will discuss with you uh, many of the attributes of the function, uh, the biology, and the pathobiology of the GI tract that I just alluded to. So, Romnick, welcome. Thank you, everyone. And what I'm going to try to do today is, over about 20 minutes, talk to you about um, some of the new uh, diseases that we are encountering, talk to you a little bit about our genes, <laughs> spend a little bit of time about the microbiome, and then talk a little bit more in detail about celiac disease. So I'm going to mainly wonder about science, but hopefully some of the uh, points that I'm going to make are going to be interesting. So who are we? We are made of our genes, the diet we eat, and the bugs within us. As Dr. Arcielo outlined, we are filled with about you know, trillions of bugs in our system that basically contribute to a major amount of our total body structure and weight. If you read the New York Times in the 19, 1860s, you often read about the various outbreaks in infectious disease, the outbreak in smallpox, yellow fever, outbreaks in cholera. But as we've sort of moved, as we've done well in our public health programs, we are sort of encountering a different type of public health. There is an explosion in the number of autoimmune diseases or diseases of the GI, I mean, uh, of the immune system. So there has been an explosion in diseases such as type 1 diabetes, asthma, allergy, multiple sclerosis, and even celiac disease. So if you look at the increase in numbers of celiac disease, you can see that this number has continued to increase. And so clearly there is something more than uh, GI tract. So I'm going to try to make the case it's all about your diet. It's about your microbiome and how the immune system responds to many of these insults. So what's celiac disease? So it's a disease with a long history. So we've known that there's been a celiac affection for many years. But uh, Samuel Gee then in 1888 outlined that there might be some ca causes of disease due to errors in diet. And a gastroenterologist, uh, pedi pediatric gastroenterologist in the Netherlands identified that the trigger behind celiac disease was the gluten within wheat. So what's gluten? So it's a product that's found in all wheat products and it has a component called gliadin, which is the product that initiates the immune response. How common is this disease? So if you look at the United States, the prevalence of the disease is close to about 1 in 200. So it's a very common disease. But there are some challenges. We are not very good in diagnosing the disease. So the, only a subset of patients present with clinical symptoms so that there is a large group of us uh, who have the disease but unaware of it unless you're tested for it. And if you look at the distribution of the disease globally, clearly the consumption of wheat correlates with the prevalence of celiac disease. So even by epidemiological studies, there is clear evidence that there is an association. We've also noticed that there are some genetic factors that I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that increase the risk of celiac disease. So it's an interaction between the diet 
your genes, and I'm going to add to this the microbiome or the bacteria within us. So what about our genes? So it's 10 years since we've sequenced the human genome. We also now have a good way of identifying the genetic variants within our body. So we can tell you what genes are different from patient A, person A, to person B. And because of the technology that was developed at the Broad Institute, we have a very rapid way of comparing changes in the genome between individuals who have health and disease or a specific trait and an absence of a trait. So unlike certain types of diseases where you inherit a dominant mutation, the diseases that I'm going to refer to as such as celiac disease and asthma and type 1 diabetes, there are many genes that contribute to the disease risk. And there is also clear evidence that your diet and environment plays a role. So this can be a trait, so it can be something like height. Again, there are many genes that contribute to whether you are tall, short, or of intermediate range. Similarly, it also can contribute to your body weight. So again, there are many genes that help either increase or decrease the risk of being obese or not obese. So genetics has told us that there is clearly gives us some insight to the very essence of who we are. There clearly gives us clues to our increased risk with diseases such as celiac disease, allergies, and so forth. But also helps us now because we can identify these genetic variants or gene changes, we can quant begin to quantify risk. But it's not all about genes. So if you take all the genetic associations that we've identified, there is clearly evidence that there are other non-gene factors that increase or decrease the risk of disease. And these are the bacteria that we encounter, but also the diet. 